Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that just got back from having lunch with Richard Simmons. He is the captain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For some of us, it's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. How's our good friend old Richard doing? Well, he's not happy with you. Let the river run red, Captain. Tonight we are drinking the Huntsman Red Ale by Barley Moe Brewing Company. Garage grade four and a quarter bottle caps out of five. Mm. This is an imperial double red ale that is not only hoppy and malty, but also smooth and sweet and has a very beautiful red color. And is brought to us by these fantastic people. First up, a big thank you to Michelle down in Clearwater, Florida. Mm, like your cheese. Next up in Parts Unknown, we have Joanne who says, I was never into true crime until I discovered your show. Thank you guys for converting me for life. And another native from Parts Unknown, our buddy Richie. Richie is our buddy on Twitter. He's not the most patient guy, but he likes to go around telling people, I like your jib. Let's go out west and give a big shout out to Rob in San Francisco. And also in California, we have John in San Jose. From Mobile, Alabama. Big shout out to Constance. And last but not least, we say thank you to Hannah in Washington, D.C. So thank you to everybody for pitching in to this week's beer fund. And if you want to buy us around for next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And make sure you follow us on social media, Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at True Crime Garage. All right, that's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. This is True Crime Garage. And this is the case of the boys on the tracks. By all accounts, the engineer did a masterful job of bringing his train to a stop. It had taken a screaming, screeching half mile. By the time the engine had shuddered to a standstill, conductor Jerry Tomlin was on the radio, notifying an approaching train on a parallel track to stop because some boys had been run over. He had also called the dispatcher. Have you got injuries? The dispatcher asked. No, Tomlin said. We've got death. I'm sure we've got death. They passed under us. It has to be death. It has it has to be death. Four AM August twenty third, nineteen eighty seven. This is a Sunday in Arkansas. There is a train traveling north from Texarkana. This train is about a mile long, pulling mostly freight but some empty cars as well. The train's headlight is set to the bright position. The crew would later say that it was particularly dark that night. The train's engineer, this is Stephen Scheuer, and the conductor Jerry Tomlin. Notice a dark spot on the tracks. Now, any debris on the tracks, of course, is a big concern. They can see a flash of light from this dark spot. The train's headlights beam, it must have hit something metal or something that reflected the light back to them. When the train was approximately 100 feet away from the dark spot, Engineer Scheuer yelled out, Oh my God, and he hit the whistle and the emergency brake at the same time. This is because they could tell that there were two young men laying on the tracks between the rails. They could also tell that there was a gun lying next to them. 
They could tell that there was something covering the boys from their waist to their knees. Both boys were between the rails with their heads up against the west rail and their feet over the east rail. Both were right beside each other and their arms and hands were at their sides, their heads facing straight up, and they didn't move at all. The train was traveling approximately 55 miles an hour. This would only give the crew just seconds to respond before running over the boys. As we had said, they hit the emergency brake, but with the weight and the speed of the train, this is going to take some time to bring this metal monster to a stop. Mm-hmm. As they are braking, the steel wheels are they're screaming on the steel tracks. The train cars vibrate. The tracks begin to vibrate as well. The whistle is blowing, and still the boys do not jerk. They do not flinch. They do not move a muscle. Now, Scheuer couldn't tell what the object was that was covering the boys, Mm -hmm. but the other two men on the train, Tomlin and this other guy, his last name is Delamar, both said that this item that was covering the boys from waist to knee was a tarp, a a pale green tarp. I believe one of the men actually said that it looked like a boat cover, Um, and they stated that the gun was clearly a rifle. The barrel was near one of the boys' head, and the stock was mostly underneath the tarp. The men watched as the bodies disappeared under the train. The men heard the train hit the boys. One of the men explained that what he was used to on occasion, the train would hit a dog. And he said that you would hear like a thud and then you would hear rocks flying because if it was something that was under the train, then the train was scooting the object along. With the boys and with the gun, the men felt the impact and they said it was very one, two, three. You could... You could feel the hit of the first boy, second boy, and then the gun. It's hard to imagine what's going through these guys' heads as they're hitting the bodies. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a complete nightmare. When the train hits an object, uh, one of two things usually happen. So there is a scoop on the front of this train that the men called a cow catcher. Mm-hmm. I believe this is a commonly used term. So either the cow catcher will hit the item and toss the object violently aside or it gets sucked up under the train. Right. And this is what happened here. And the two boys' legs were laying on the track. So what happened was the feet were actually severed by the train. Yes, severed from the legs, and the heads and the torsos were between the tracks, so the train would have cleared the bodies and then rolled them under the train. Uh, This is what the three men on board had heard. So armed with flashlights, the men get off of the train, and they went looking for what they had hit. About 35 cars back, they located the first of many pieces that they would find. Right, train cars. Yeah, they they spotted some dismembered toes. The biggest body part that they found was the chest and head of the second boy. The first boy, was he was much more chopped up. The police had started to arrive on the scene, Um, And they basically found parts of the gun and the bodies scattered along a quarter mile of the tracks. Mm -hmm. One thing the crew members noticed very quickly was that there was a lot less blood than any of them had expected to see. Mm -hmm. And the blood that they did see and find, it was dark. It wasn't, it wasn't red. It was a purplish color. And like you said, they have experience with, you know, hitting the train, the train hitting a dog. Mm-hmm. or a cow or a deer or something of that nature. Yeah, and, and in this area of the country, too, these are guys that were familiar with hunting. Mm-hmm. Um, so they, they knew kind of what to expect. Unfortunately, in this situation, that's why they were so freaked out, was they knew what they were expecting to see, and they were terrified going back there looking for that. Well, yeah, because it's on a whole different level. I mean, it's one thing to hit a deer, but to hit two teenage boys. Mm-hmm. The police were there at 4.40 a.m. This is just about 13 minutes after the crew had reported the incident. Mm -hmm. This fell to the jurisdiction of the Saline County Sheriff's Office. On the scene, we have Deputy Chuck Talent and Lieutenant Ray Richman, who was the head of the department's criminal investigation division. After checking out the scene, the officers decided that they were investigating either an accident or or a suicide. Mm-hmm. The crew working the train immediately disagreed with the officers. They knew that, of course, accidents certainly do happen around trains, and suicides do as well. 
But the troubling thing here is that the men saw neither boy move at all. Right. If if it were a suicide, they said they might be able to be talked into agreeing that one person could brave through the terrifying situation of the train approaching them, but none of the men would agree that two people could lay there and not flinch or not move a muscle as the train got closer and closer. Right, which I, I think I agree with them on. Uh, I just think that's a really hard thing to even speculate. Mm-hmm. Also at the scene was State Trooper Wayne Lanehart of the Arkansas State Police. Mm -hmm. Now, Lanehart was concerned by what he saw at the scene, but let's keep in mind, he this is not his jurisdiction. Right. Uh, this is the jurisdiction of the sheriff's office, so he is at their mercy. So I'm assuming that it was a, the call was made and he was just in close proximity, so he then showed up to see if they need any assistance. Yeah, everybody was responding to this call. So this is not his case. He is pretty Mm -hmm. much just a spectator at this point. But the thing that bothered him the most was the sheriff deputy's disinterest in the possibility of a murder. According to Lanehart's training, any unnatural death should be investigated first as a possible homicide so evidence can be preserved and the most serious possibilities eliminated before less serious ones are considered. Lanehart, after having talked with the crew members, told the deputies that he doubted the deaths were an accident. Right. Another cause for concern was the observations made by the emergency medical technicians arriving on the scene. Right, the EMTs. Yeah. They both said that the bodies looked more like mannequins because there was so little blood. And at the impact site, the blood that they found was really dark in color, more a purple than a red. Mm-hmm. They didn't see any bright blood, and this led them to believe that the blood that they were seeing was not fresh. Who were the two boys on the tracks that night, and why were they there? Mm-hmm. The boys were 17-year-old Kevin Ives and 16-year-old Don Henry. And I know it's 1987, and there wasn't a lot of uh, law enforcement didn't crack down on curfew as often. Mm-hmm. But what is a 16 and 17 year old boy doing out by these train tracks? I mean, it's Saturday. They, they're hanging out Saturday. And then this happens at 4 a.m. on Sunday. Yeah. So it was the weekend. Yeah. Well, this is a rural area. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, you don't see curfews really enforced a whole lot out in these parts. Um, but basically the boys were staying the night at Don Henry's home. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they, they got there around 12, 15 AM. Uh, Don lives with his parents, Curtis and his stepmother, Marvel Henry. Now the two were supposed to be staying the night at Don's house. They had known each other about six months. Uh, they had become quick friends hanging out together very often. Uh, this was the summertime nearing the start of another school year. So they were, you know, the two of them were trying to make the most of their summer, what, what they had left. Right. Uh, Kevin had stayed at Don's place once or twice before, but Kevin's mother, Linda, was not real excited about Kevin staying there that night. Uh, in fact, she had originally said no to the request because last time he had stayed there, she didn't approve of what went down. On that occasion, Don's father had called Linda the morning after and asked if the boys were at her house. Right. And, and she says, she says, no, you know, they, they were supposed to be at, at your place. I don't, I don't know what happened here. Right. Why? So they did a switcheroo. Well, what, what it turns out that what happened was that, uh, at some point Don had gotten an argument with his father, Curtis. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the, the after the argument, the two boys went and decided to stay at another friend's house that night. Um, so Curtis maybe thought that they went back to Kevin's, and it turns out that that was not not the case. Well, it's very embarrassing when you have a friend over and you get an argument with your parents. Mm-hmm. That's always like, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm really sorry that my mom's being a big old B right now. Well, I'm sure Kevin's parents would have wished that they would have returned to to their place rather than just going just to going this somewhere un, else. Yeah. yeah. This unscripted place that they ended up. Um, so of course, Linda was reluctant to let Kevin go over there on this occasion, but mm-hmm. you know how it goes. Teenagers talk their parents into things. Uh, so on that night, the two had been hanging out with some friends. Uh, they were told to be home by midnight or 1230 at the latest. So once they were back at Don's place, they had asked Don's father, Curtis, if they could go out hunting. 
this is spotlighting, which is an illegal form of hunting. Plus, I wouldn't think that anything would be in season at that time of year. Now, Don was an avid hunter, so he was, you know, this activity sounds a bit strange to me, uh, but I get the impression that this could have been a common thing here for him. Uh, Plus, it doesn't sound to me as if Don's parents, or at least Don's father, Curtis, was the strictest of parents. Right. Uh, Well, and some people remember what their childhood was like when, mm -hmm. when it's summertime, and they think, you know, some parents get a little more loose. In, in the summertime. And I, I think that's okay. Well, I used to be a, you know, have to be in by a certain time, but in the summertime, a lot of times my parents would let me pitch a tent in the backyard, you mm-hmm. know, and have somebody stay over. So really I wasn't totally under their watchful eye. Um, but spotlighting is where you go out with flashlights and a gun. And when you come across some unfortunate animal, and I don't know what they were hunting for, uh, or maybe if they were just looking for any type of creature out there, um, but basically you, you shine your flashlight on the animal and the light beam will pretty much lock up the animal. Like the old saying, freeze up like a deer in the headlights. Well, this makes the animal a very easy target. So they asked Curtis if they can go out spotlighting mm-hmm. and he says, yes. And that is the last time that the boys are known to be seen alive. Yeah. Last time that they're known to be seen alive by a- any parents or close family members. Mm-hmm. This story, which has not been covered often, has so many twists and turns, and I dare say maybe one of the most interesting cases, most fascinating cases with as many twists that you will ever hear in a case. Yeah, it, it it's crazy. It starts off as a small town case, and it could be, I mean, it could be huge. Well, it starts out as a, as a small town case that people think it's an accident or suicide. Mm-hmm. The next morning, Curtis, the father, he gets up around 5 Mm a.m. And he wakes up his wife, Marvel, saying that that Don should have been home by now, but wasn't. And he tells her that he really thinks that something is wrong here. Curtis Mm -hmm. goes out looking for the boys. He knew where the boys were going to go hunt, uh, so he headed to the woods near the train tracks. He's out driving around looking for Don and Kevin. And while he's out there, he passes a uh, deputy. Mm -hmm. And he slows down and he stops and he asks the deputy if they had seen two teenagers out there running around. The deputy asks who the man was looking for. And Curtis, knowing that the boys were out hunting illegally, he decided that he didn't want to name any names. Right. You know, Um, so Curtis is going to continue on looking for the boys. The officer also didn't say that they had found two boys on the train tracks when when Curtis had stopped to talk to him. Right. After driving around for a few hours, Curtis went home and he called Linda and he asked her if the boys were at her place. And of course now she's thinking, Oh no, not again. This happened last time. And why the hell can't this other parent keep the kids at his house? Right. Uh, she asked if there was an argument. Uh, he says, no, there was nothing like that, that the boys had simply went out hunting and they must've stayed out all night. Uh, he told Linda not to worry because Don had hunted often. Uh, he was very responsible with a firearm and he knew the woods better than anyone. Mm-hmm. Linda was beginning to get quite worried about Kevin though. Well, and like we said, we're 16 and 17 year old and you have your little stomping grounds. Mm-hmm. So it seems like Don, one of Don's stomping grounds was these woods. And, you know, and, and back when I was, uh, probably, you know, elementary school and middle school, there was woods by my house. And if you took it, you know, if a parent came back looking for a kid, they couldn't find their way around. Right. But, but, but the you, kids knew how to get through every inch of that woods around noon. The phone rang again and it was Curtis. Uh, Linda could tell by his voice that this call was much different than the last call. He says, get over here quick. They've been shot and tied to the railroad tracks and they've been run over by the train. Now, this might sound a little weird here, but Linda, of course, she she's in shock by what she has just heard. Yeah, obviously. But she she says that she was actually somewhat relieved once she had a chance to kind of process what Curtis had said. Uh, Linda was worried that the boys could have been in a car wreck. You know, they, they were both young drivers at this time. They both owned fast cars. Don had a 
Firebird and Kevin had a Camaro. Right. Uh, 1987. But yeah, but she said what Curtis had told her sounded so absurd that it couldn't have possibly happened, that it couldn't be the truth. Right, right. So Linda drives over to Curtis, Curtis Henry's home. When she pulled up to the place, she sees Kevin's car at the end of the driveway, and this makes her feel very good. Uh, she's immediately thinking that Kevin had returned to the Henry's and nobody was in a car wreck and you know, all is good again. Right. Well, maybe, maybe something happened and maybe they were on these tracks, but they're okay now. Mm-hmm. Well, that feeling quickly left her as she's getting out of the car, a deputy, this is deputy talent came out from the house and he asked her to come inside. So we go right, here from, right, right. from a lot of relief to very worried. Curtis, right in front of the officer, tells Linda that a neighbor had told him that the boys had been shot, they had been tied to the tracks, and they've been run over by the train. Now, the police officer, he states that the boys, yes, there there had been two boys that had been run over by a train. Now, these boys had not been positively identified yet, Mm -hmm. and they were going to be checking dental records at the crime lab to figure out who these boys were. Right, but you have no whereabouts of your two, of these two teenage boys. Mm-hmm. That you know that they went out at night. You know what area they went at. Yeah, you know they went in the woods down by the train tracks. Right, and you now and they didn't come home, and their vehicles are at your house. Mm-hmm. So this is this is very troublesome. Well, deputy talent, he asked Linda for a description of what Kevin was wearing the last time that she had seen him. Um, she describes this and he does say that that fit with the items that they had found at the tracks. Um, what led the officers to Curtis Henry's door? They had found a camouflage baseball cap with the, with a little rock electric logo on it. This is a, the electric company in the area. Right now, Curtis was a superintendent with that company. And Don had had one of those hats. Right. Don wanted to become an electrician, uh, just like his father after graduating from high school. Right. And that summer he had actually kind of taken Don under his wing a little bit and would bring him into work f- with him and, you know, kind of show him the ropes a little bit to see if this was something he actually wanted to do after graduating high school. So unfortunately this is a, this is a hat that he knew that Don would have been wearing that night. Right, so the writing is pretty much on the wall. Yeah, and unfortunately, the boys would soon later be positively identified as the two boys who had been run over by the train that night. Right, that being Don Henry and Kevin Ives. Now, there are still plenty of more weird things about that night that we haven't even got to yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, The first strange thing here is remember that at the beginning of the show, we had said that the train's conductor had called another train that was passing on a parallel track. And he called them telling them to stop because they had just run over some boys. Uh, Well, once the officers had arrived and they began scoping out the scene, the sheriffs told the other train that it could then continue on. Well, this is before collecting some of the remains or looking for potential evidence of a crime here. Right. You know, nothing stirs up a crime scene area like a giant train passing through right next the crew had said that they and this is all three of the crew members they all got the same feeling that the sheriff's office the the officers that were on the scene they said that they didn't even believe that any of them were looking for any clues as to what had happened first off they were obviously looking at this thing like it was an accident or a double suicide And not only that, but the officers were overheard being told, hey, treat this as a traffic accident. Yeah. And and I'm guessing that this might have been the extent of their expertise. You know, they were probably all familiar with traffic fatalities, but not very familiar with, you know, a potential double double murder scene and probably not a scene as complicated as this one. Uh, this next bit is is extremely strange in my mind uh, regarding the sheriffs that night. Uh, it's like they were trying to pull the old Jedi mind trick on the train crew. After listening to each of the crew members' statements, the deputy and the lieutenant told the crew members that they had all been mistaken, that there was no tarp covering the boys. Do or do not. 
There is no try. Yeah. They, they, they simply told the guys that they were confused by how dark it had been that night and that there was simply no tarp. Um, the next thing that the sheriffs did was confusing too as well, because they also seemed to doubt the men's statements that there was a gun present with the boys. Right. And we know from Curtis, from Don's father, that they were out there to hunt. Mm-hmm. So makes a lot of sense that there would be a gun beside the boys. Right. Right. And we, and we know that, but, but the officers at the scene, they don't know any of that information yet, but it's very strange here, captain. Why would they, when you take the, the train crew statements, Mm-hmm. Uh, and you, then you're going to go out and look at the scene and, and unfortunately have this terrible job of collecting things there. Why would you have any reason to doubt them without walking the scene yet? Why, why would you even say that there was no tarp? Why would you say that there's no gun? Um, I don't even know why you would even question that when you just take their statements and not even make any mm. observations of your own until you've walked the scene. Well, and as you're walking the scene, maybe they're just having a hard time finding these items. What? So therefore, well, I can't find it. So maybe you are mistaken. I mean, I, I don't think all that stuff is nefar- you know, nefarious. I think some of it is just simply, well, maybe, you know, it was super dark. You have this bright light coming in from your train mm-hmm. and maybe you didn't see exactly what you think you saw. I, I can agree with that. I can agree with that. The train is traveling very fast. It's very dark out that night. These men are trained, though, to spot things on the tracks. Um, that is one thing that they do, you know. Right, but what what a law enforcement should do is just take the statement. Mm-hmm. And if the statement is a little off, that's okay. That is the statement from that individual, not a statement that you guys made in a joint effort. Right. Right. And and don't react to those statements until you have an opportunity to check out the scene and collect evidence to, you know, because they're probably walking in there thinking this was an accident or this was a suicide. It's the only things that seem to make sense here. Um, but it's, it's weird that they have this kind of preconceived notion before even really collecting evidence. Yeah, but we see this time and time again with law enforcement. It's mm-hmm. you create a narrative. And then you make that evidence fit your narrative instead of collecting the evidence and collecting the statements and letting that create your narrative. Yeah. And while they're walking the scene with the crew members, uh, they even state several times, you know, where, so where is this alleged gun? Where, where is this so-called gun that you guys saw? We have law enforcement creating a narrative. Mm -hmm. Now we need to do an autopsy on these bodies to actually figure out you know, that's going to point us in a direction too. And this is where the first twist in this story takes place. We'll get to that right after this quick beer break. Right, we're back. Cheers, mates. Yeah, we have two boys that are found dead on the train tracks, and we do have autopsies that we need to get to. But I, real quickly, I want to go through a couple more things about that night before we get to those autopsies. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had talked about the gun. You know that the the officers refused to believe the crew statement that there was a gun present. The present that they had seen one. Right, and like we said before, Curtis uh, Henry. Don Henry's father said they went out hunting Mm -hmm. and while they're searching the crime scene, they start referring to this gun as the alleged gun or the so-called gun. It was not until the sheriff's office had actually recovered pieces of a shattered 22 rifle with that. They would believe that there was even a gun present, right? So they did recover shattered pieces of a 22 rifle. Uh, they, there were no bullets in it at the time. There was no tarp found. Um, I could see a tarp just getting ripped to shreds, uh, you know, if it's covering the boys. Well, possibly, but you also have the other train Mm -hmm. that just, they let go. Mm -hmm. And I could totally see a, a a tarp being trapped into a a train somehow. Yeah. And it gets pulled along. 
It, you're exactly right. And and not only that, they're not even looking for a tarp. They're refusing to believe that it, it exists. Right, right. But so they, as they, they're collecting evidence, they, they, they weren't looking for these things. And these things were scattered for about a quarter mile of track. And there was also other items that were found left at the track as well. Mm-hmm. So the boys were, the train incident took place on a Sunday. Well, Monday morning comes and the deaths are reported in the news and in the papers. Mm -hmm. So people start going down to the tracks to check out the scene. Uh, One group that went down there, they found a... I like to call those people whiskers. Whiskers. Because they're curious like a cat. Mm. Well, these people, uh, be careful what you wish for. They went down to the track, this one group, and they found a severed foot in the gravel. Uh, that was missed by the sheriff's department. Right. So you don't believe that there is a gun. You don't believe that there's a tarp. You find evidence of the gun. Mm-hmm. And then you'd leave a foot behind. Yeah. Right. I mean, and like we said, some of the police officers that were at the scene at the time said, look, you have to assume that this is a homicide scene mm-hmm. and you need to do your due diligence. So therefore we can get some answers. And this is direct evidence to point that they said, well, this is a suicide or accident case shut. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, it became, it became well-known knowledge that the sheriff's investigators never even roped off the scene. Um, And some other people recovered parts of the gun from that scene that the sheriff's office had missed. Well, congratulations. When they returned Don's clothing to the Henry's, um, his stepmother found a small bag of pot in his pocket. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the officers had missed this entirely. And two days after the boys' death, the sheriffs, they, they offer a statement saying, hey, we haven't ruled out anything except for foul play. We ruled that out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In review of the investigation, it was learned that the sheriff's office spent about a week on the investigation. This mostly consisted of interviews with friends and classmates of the two boys. Uh, most of these interviews contained the same two questions. Well, heck, most of these interviews only consisted of two questions. Mm-hmm. One, how much drugs did the boys use? And two, were they suicidal? Right, and this is what makes me go bonkers, man. It's, it's again, like we said, they are they have a theory, and then they're trying to create the narrative. Mm-hmm. And we see this time and time again. It's, it's just, it's utter malarkey. Yeah, and usually even in an accidental death when they are an invest when they're investigating it, they will typically ask friends and relatives, "Well, do you know anybody that would have wanted to hurt this person?" Right. Or why? And you know, and this is not even a question that is posed to most of these people. Right, but you're asking people the same question. Uh, are they suicidal? How much drugs did they use? Mm-hmm. And then it creates the story amongst the people that, well, that's must be what happened here. Right. And then and then obviously Think about the family. Why would you? Why would you tell your parents? Why one? Why would you spend the night with anybody? And then why would you decide to? Oh well, let's just go hunting, and uh, let's now let's just lay down on the tracks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And again, like you said, you'd have to have. I mean, you'd have to have the balls, nerves of steel, man, to lay there on that track mm-hmm. and let that happen. Well, this story obviously very quickly became big time news all across the state of Arkansas. Not only was the story a parent's worst nightmare, but it was a strange and horrible story all at the same time. Of course, the rumor mill ran wild and there were a lot of theories regarding the deaths being traded around dinner tables, dinners at local bars and, you know, all over the state of Arkansas. One of the things that I find a little creepy about this and uh, our longtime listeners would know we, we covered the Phantom Killer, also known as the Texarkana murders, mm-hmm. and and f- having the train come from Texarkana adds a little bit to the creep factor for me. The sheriff's office officially seemed to be describing the deaths as an apparent accident, but would not give it that official title yet, stating that the official cause of death would have to come from the state medical examiner's office. Unfortunately, when the deputies were speaking with the families, they suggested that suicide was a more likely explanation. Right. Again, coming up with your own narrative. Well, and both sets of parents disagreed with this thought. Uh, From the beginning, uh, you know, there was no evidence that the boys were suicidal. 
there was some evidence that the boys had been using drugs. Uh, one, 1. 1.9 grams of marijuana was found in the pocket of Kevin's jeans. Right. And not always is there signs of somebody struggling with, you know, suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. Here's another strange thing to this story though, captain, uh, that is often not reported. Kevin's father, Larry Ives, he was an engineer for the railroad. Mm -hmm. Uh, the route that the train was on that passed over the boys, that route just months before it was his route. Um, and it was just pure coincidence that that route was no longer Larry's or he would have been driving the train that night. Right. So he would have, he would have been engineering the train that basically, you know, uh, ran over his own son. Mm -hmm. The parents obviously were devastated by the tragedy, but they were also disappointed in the sheriff's office and how they handled this incident. They were anxiously awaiting the medical examiner's ruling on the cause of deaths. Uh, and they wanted answers, obviously. A week after the funerals, the medical examiner had finished his report and a meeting with the parents was scheduled. When the parents arrived, they were first met in the parking lot by officers from the sheriff's office. There was also an officer from the Arkansas State Police there as well. This was really good news to the parents, as they had been requesting multiple times in this short time period that the case be transferred to the state police, um, Mm -hmm. but that had not been done. Uh, Kevin's parents brought a potential useful item with them. Larry and some of his friends went to the site where the boys had died. When, when they were there, they found a large piece of cardboard. The piece was large enough that it could have been used to drag two bodies on it. There was also a stain on it and that stain could have been blood. Right. Larry knew that the sheriff's office didn't have the technology or the capability to properly analyze it. So he wanted to bring it directly to the medical examiner's office in the parking lot. He showed the piece of cardboard to the state police officer and he turns it over to him there. We have a 16 and 17 year old and obviously they're just teenagers, but they're becoming young men. And you know, you have a lot of growth spurts at those times. So we're talking about two big individuals Mm -hmm. that, you know, now it's very possible if there was foul play that they were, they were attacked on the train tracks because we know that's where they are at. But if they were attacked somewhere else and they used this piece of cardboard, anybody that knows it's like a sled push or something like in weightlifting, yeah. you can put on a ton of weight, but because it's on, on a different surface, you can drag that surface. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, uh, most people can't pick up a couch, but people can push it around their living room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And unfortunately this, possible piece of evidence um it's not seen again after this situation he the father gives it to the state officer and he's told that it's going to get where it needs to go to be examined and that just simply doesn't happen right and again the the my issue is you'd have to test this to one find out if it was blood if there was blood then we can assume that this was used to maybe transport the bodies Mm -hmm. but here's the other thing about it this is the thing that frustrates me is whoever used, if that was used to transport the bodies, then there's a good likelihood that there was fingerprints on there. Right, right. And, and, and that's what frustrates me. When the parents went inside to meet the medical examiner, uh, this is Fami Malik is his name. Uh, they were... Yeah, and his face looks exactly like the way his name sounds. Okay. Uh, but Fami the- well, the, his face is very foamy. When the parents first met Malik, they found him to be weird. Uh, when they first arrived, Malik took Polaroid pictures of each parent and had asked each of them to sign forms so it was official as to who was in attendance at this meeting. Oh, I thought you were going to say <laughs> he took pictures. He took Polaroid pictures of him. Then he asked him to shake it <laughs> like a Polaroid picture. Malik then passed out copies of his official ruling. Mm-hmm. The statement read something like this. At 4.25 a.m., August 23rd, 1987, Kevin Ives, 17, and Don Henry, 16, were unconscious in a deep sleep on the railroad tracks under the psychedelic influence of THC, marijuana, when a train passed over them, causing their accidental deaths. The parents began questioning Dr. Malik, not really his ruling, but they wanted more information because none of them had ever heard of people passing out from THC. 
Right. According to the parents, Malik seemed very irritated at the additional questions. I think that he thought that they would simply hear his final ruling, accept it, and then leave. This is very surprising to me that he would not have expected questions or that he would have seemed irritated at the additional questions given his amount of experience in these matters. You know, no one handles a sudden death well, and loved ones are always left with a lot of questions when someone suddenly dies, especially if it's your kids, and especially if the circumstances surrounding those deaths are abnormal. This guy has the bedside manner of a wolverine. He basically states that marijuana levels in the boys were extremely high. Drawing a line on a chalkboard, he writes a large five below the line and a 100 above it. Pointing to the 100, he says, this is how stoned they were. Well, you know, old Captain Fami over here, I think part of his annoyance is that, you know, he's an expert in his mind. Mm -hmm. And here's my findings and kind of how dare you question me. Yeah. Well, of course, the parents are still confused as the doctor has not clearly explained this very well. Right. Uh, When they ask him what kind of measurement is that, Malik snaps back and says, it's units. The parents wanted this explained to them in an easier terms because marijuana was not something they were familiar with. They didn't know if passing out was possible or likely or, or really what they wanted to know how much pot the kids would have had to have smoked to achieve these high levels of THC. Malik never really answers that particular question, right? The more the parents question him or push him for reasonable answers, the more the doctor gets upset with them. And at some point, he holds up a large envelope stating that inside are the autopsy photos, and in these photos is the proof that you are looking for. Well, the parents, of course, they they don't want to see these photos at all. Right. And they told him that they didn't want to see these photos. Yeah, I don't know what parent would want to see that. Yeah, they wanted toxicology results and Malik insisted that they see the photos as crazy as this whole story sounds. I believe this is true because remember the officers are there with the parents at this time and at this meeting. Yeah. And we already know that they are not all on the same page, but one of the officers, yeah, just meaning that some of the officers think from the get go, this should be, this should have been looked at as a homicide. And then some of the other ones just going, this is probably accidental Mm -hmm. or possibly suicide. Well, and the officers know that the parents are dissatisfied with, with the officer's investigation of this incident. Yeah. And I think the officer's hearts would have to go out to those parents. And this is why this statement has to be true because one of the officers then stands up at the table and this is an increasingly heated debate. But he says, pointing to the photos, pointing to the envelope, he says, they don't want to see those. Right. Uh, That same officer, as he begins to take his seat again, he tells the parents that Malik had told them that 20 joints is what the boys would have had to have smoked to to have that high level of THC. That, you know, I am not a, you know, pot smoker myself, but I would just assume that 20 joints is is a lot of joints. Yes, 20 joints would be a considerable amount of... I mean, even if you just put it in like terms of like cigarettes, like a normal cigarette package has 20 cigarettes in it. Mm-hmm. So they would have had to smoke 20 cigarettes within hours? I, I don't know, but it sounds that way because he's pointing to the 100 mark and saying this is how stoned these guys were. Right. Um, it, it seems like, uh, yeah, but I would have walked up to that board and pointed to that hundred and said, Mr. Fami, this is how much of an asshole you are. <laughs> that's what, that's what that 100 means. Well, Malik, he denies that he had ever told the officers such a statement. He says, I never told the officers that it would have taken 20 joints. Um, and the officers, they had reason to believe that the boys purchased a $10 bag of marijuana on one of their stops that night. Um, the, the police, <laughs> right. It's a man. If you can get 20 joints out of $10 of marijuana. Yeah. It'd be a bad business to be in because you could, you could, you could spend $10 and be good for quite some time. Right. Uh, the medical examiner's findings not only seemed questionable to the parents, but most of the citizens of Arkansas were pretty stunned by the ruling. Uh, this is according to the newspapers, the parents decided to seek a second opinion. They hired a second pathologist to review the deaths. 
Now, this was a pathologist that came recommended to them uh, from other physicians in the area. This is Dr. J.T. Francisco. He's located in Memphis, Tennessee. He was charging the parents $200 an hour, uh, and he explained to them that he would preserve and test the blood of both boys and the urine of Kevin. They would be unable to test Don's urine because his bladder had been completely destroyed. Right. And then also the, this is the first time that the parents are aware that, that his urine hasn't been tested. Yeah. So we're seeing some progress here for the parents. Uh, they received the results from Dr. Francisco, uh, and he actually confirms Dr. Malik's ruling. Uh, he quoted the same levels of THC that Malik had reported. 100. 97 micrograms per milliliter for Kevin and 122 for Don. Okay. Upon further review of the material sent to the parents from Dr. Francisco's office, they were able to determine that the results were from a test of Kevin's urine only. No blood from either boy or no urine from Don were tested. All right. So he's agreeing with, you know, Mr. Fami. Yeah. So they get Dr. Francisco on the phone and after some debate on how he could have confirmed Malik's findings with only having tested the urine of one boy, Mm -hmm. uh, the doctor then admitted that they had arrived at the conclusion by inference uh, because his lab and the Arkansas lab followed standard procedures. The confirmation of one test gave weight of confidence that the other findings were going to be true as well. Right. But couldn't they just test both of their bloods? But they didn't. That's the whole thing. They were led to believe that that both sets of blood would be tested. They didn't test any of that, but they, but they claim that they can back up Malik's findings. Right. So we have the Ives family and the Henry family kind of getting dicked around again. Mm -hmm. In February of 1988, the parents contacted members of the media to arrange for a press conference. This is a brilliant idea, and they arrived at this plan because the longer this thing went on, they were beginning to realize that the only group interested in this case was the media. No other group wanted to spend any time on this thing. The day after the press conference, the families were contacted by Richard Garrett, who is the district deputy prosecuting attorney. Garrett wanted to help. He told Linda that until he saw the press conference, he had no idea that the parents of the dead boys had been dissatisfied with the sheriff's department. Mm -hmm. He was going to hold a prosecutor's hearing. Well, what's that exactly? Well, he's hoping that they will re-examine the case, but a a prosecutor's hearing is not just unusual. They are highly unusual. These are intended for only special inquiries, uh, particularly when the cause of death is in dispute. Well, here the the cause of death is definitely in dispute. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have two coroners saying, well, they, they got super stoned. And then they lay down on the tracks and they got ran over by a train. Mm-hmm. And then the parents are going, well, that just doesn't add up. It doesn't make a lot of sense to us. Mm-hmm. Well, the uh, deputy prosecuting attorney, Garrett, he would introduce the families to a man by the name of Dan Harmon. Now, Dan Harmon is actually a guy that is off in a private practice. He's not a prosecutor. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he's going to be brought in as a, quote unquote, special prosecutor in this situation. And he is going to make arrangements because he wants to get a grand jury organized so that this case can be looked at by some fresh eyes and decide if the, an investigation should shift gears or if that there's a chance of a trial taking place. Here. Right, right. So basically, this grand jury is going to be set up. They're going to look at the evidence and they're going to decide, do we need to reinvestigate this case or is it shut, you know, open and shut case where these guys smoked some pot and then they had an accident where the train ran over them. Mm-hmm. And more importantly, if, if the, the cause of death is what's in question, what the big dispute is, then can we get, you know, another autopsy? Can we get other autopsies performed on these two bodies? Right. And after a couple more autopsies are performed, I think part of it too, is like, you don't want the families uh, of these, you know, victims they are victims of at least at this point, a tragic accident, you don't want them to de- be dissatisfied with uh, law enforcement and the way uh, the coroner or anybody else handled their loved one's case. Mm-hmm. So upon further review, the grand jury, the first thing that they're going to do is determine if this cause of death is correct. 
And their findings, they're not agreeing with what Dr. Malik had stated. And they basically overturn the cause of death as a possible accident, as a likely accident to a possible homicide. Well, once that takes place, they're going to need to bring in somebody to conduct a further investigation into this autopsy and take a look at this thing and see if their findings are correct. Right. So we already have two autopsies done. So this is technically going going to be the third autopsy done. Yes. So this, they will bring in a man by the name of Dr. Burton and they actually bring him in from Atlanta. Uh, They wanted to bring in somebody that had more experience and somebody with outside eyes that wasn't so privy to what was going on in the area. They bring in Dr. Burton and what are his findings? Well, to begin with, one of the things that he found most disconcerting or most important to this case is the shirt that was worn by Don Henry or allegedly worn by Don Henry. This is the shirt that was not on the boy's body when he was found. This was found some distance away from the track where the torso and the body of Don Henry were discovered. All right. So Don didn't have a shirt on, but this shirt was possibly ran over by the train. Yes, yes. This shirt, as we know, has a lot of tears and defects in it. A question that was raised as to whether these tears or defects were made by the body being pulled down the track by the motion of the train over the body of the victim. What Burton did was he had took the shirt to a private laboratory that he had worked in in Atlanta. And they took one of these tears. This was a tear from the lower back area of the shirt that was kind of in the area of of an injury that they had found on the back of Don Henry. And they took a scalpel and they cut this defect out, which measured a little bit over an inch in length. They then took this defect and they analyzed it under a scanning electron microscope, which is a very powerful microscope. And with this microscope, they could tell whether the fabric had been torn or cut with something like scissors or a knife. Right, so what he's saying is this cut on the shirt and the body was either made by scissors or a knife. Yeah, well, basically basically what he can say is that the cut on the shirt, it exhibited all the characteristics of something that was cut with a very sharp blade. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, there's no question as far as this being a tear or anything like that as far as Dr. Burton is concerned. Also around the cut in the shirt, they found evidence of blood. Which means? Which means that the the boy had probably bled through some kind of injury before the shirt was removed from his body. Right, so we're starting to assume that this uh, injury was um, pre-mortem. Yes, yes. And and here's the, to kind of lay it out very quickly here of Burton's concerns, right? First of all, we have the the knife. He believes a knife made this cut in the shirt. Mm -hmm. Second of all, it's majorly concerning to him that this cut matches up with it with an injury to the boy's back and that more importantly that the shirt was not found on the boy's body meaning that if this was an injury that was sustained by the train itself that you would expect to see you would expect to see the the shirt still on the boy matching right, up right, with the right, injury right. another thing that concerned Burton was an injury found to the left cheek of Kevin Ives Uh, This was an injury that he did not find consistent with any pattern that might have been made from being struck by the cow catcher in front of the engine. Mm -hmm. Uh, He explained that he sent photographs of the boy's injuries to a computer enhancement specialist, and he was awaiting those results. So we have two things that he finds pretty odd. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are injuries that would not be consistent with, with the train. Now, the thing is, once they get those results back, Captain, he finds as well as the the specialists that he sent them to, they find that that injury to Kevin's cheek is consistent with that of being struck in the face with like the butt of a gun. Mm. And more specifically, uh, they said that the gun that was found with the boys could have very likely made that injury or caused that injury. It would have been a similar type gun or that gun. The other thing that's interesting here, Captain, is that he would find something in both of the boys that would give him cause of concern. Uh, This is the amount of congestion and fluid in the lungs of both of the boys. He felt that this was inconsistent with the type of injuries that one might expect from someone being run over by a train. When you have a sudden death occurring, he feels that it's very likely 
uh, that the possibility exists that because there's this con- congestion and fluid in the lungs, mm-hmm. that both boys were either unconscious or already dead when they were placed on those tracks. They're either dead or they're knocked unconscious, and that's why they didn't move at all. Mm-hmm. And so the, the train possibly did cause their death, but who put them there? Mm-hmm. Who made them unconscious? Another thing that he included in the autopsies as well, and this is more opinion than it is fact, um, but he had agreed with the train crew members, stating that he, he didn't see how anyone, whether they be passed out from drug use or be sleeping on the tracks, how they would not have you know, woke up as the train was getting closer and closer. These, these rails, they vibrate. The The train was extremely loud. Anybody that even has ever stood next to a train just yeah. on the ground, you can feel the ground moving below your feet. Uh, there was also a state trooper that was involved with the uh, grand jury who had gone down to the train tracks with, with some other people witnessing him. And he timed this so that he would be arriving and he could, he could do this little experiment as a train was coming. He laid down exactly how the boys were laying on the tracks Mm -hmm. and he jumped up from the, from the rails pretty quickly. But he said that, you know, when this train was, this train was still quite a ways away, maybe a quarter of a mile. He said he felt the thing when it was like a mile and a half away from him, he could feel it coming down the tracks. And then on top of that, he said he, he, he got terrified. And to the point where he says he still has a little bit of, like PTSD just from, from that moment experiencing that little experience. He was also conscious at the time. Correct. All right. So this third autopsy, it it brings up some questions and, and it seems like it's not that agreeable with the first two autopsies, Mm -hmm. which I think, you know, causes a lot of concern. I think it also causes a lot of concern with the parents. Well, as far as that second test goes, and let's let's call that a test rather than an autopsy because it was supposed to be a testing of the boy's blood and the boy's urine. Um, you're, it, you're exactly correct. Thank you. And and but we know that that <laughs> didn't take place. Right. Um, mm-hmm. But not only does this point out here that the the autopsies were probably wrong, but now this really starts to make you question the medical examiner himself. Uh, you know. What what is he up to? Why how would he have arrived at these conclusions uh, after performing an autopsy? He had a significant amount of time to perform these tests, and he comes up with a completely different ruling than what this this other guy comes up with from from Atlanta. Right, and look, then it becomes which doctor is correct. Well, because of this whole case, we have a lot of interesting things come out about Malik. Yes. And Malik has all these autopsies that were ruled normally natural causes or accidental. And because of this, you know, because of the parents, mm-hmm. and I applaud the parents, so they start stirring in the pot. And then they start going back and looking at some of his other autopsies. Right. We have a scenario where he ruled a guy well, saying... We're, ju- we're just going to tell you about some of the more wild ones. Let's call them wild. And, and we won't use any names because these pick... These particular people are only involved in this case through Malik. They have really no, right. You know, nothing to do with this case, but this gives you an idea of some of the shenanigans going on with Fami Malik. Right. So old Fami, he, you know, rules this guy dies of a ulcer and not a big deal. Right. That's right? his ruling. The guy and, died of an ulcer and everybody actually agrees with him. Mm. Says, Hey, Malik did his job again, but they had people find this guy's head. Yeah, so he was decapitated. Apparently, that happens naturally when you have an ulcer. Uh, your head just pops off. Right. Um, so once they found this severed head, they realized this autopsy was completely botched. Yeah. Do, do you want to know how he defended himself on that particular case? Sure. So um, here's what happened here. They they found the the dog that lived with this guy. Uh, he actually lay dead in his home for for quite some time. Uh, the dog that lived there, they recovered some of the dog's vomit, and in it they found what what Fami believed to be uh, evidence of of human tissue of right. of skin. Um, so what had happened was Fami said that the guy had died and he lay there for quite some time. And at some point the dog, 
uh, chewed on the neck and to the point of decapitating uh, his owner. Okay. Um, but of course, <laughs> the thing here is it, it was ev- all the evidence points to a very clean cut right. of somebody killing this guy and taking off his head, not the gnawing of a dog uh, chewing chewing up this this guy's neck. Right, and then there's this other case where the guy, this guy was suicidal. He 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 told his family about it. Yeah, they they put him in a, in a place for treatment. He uh, wanted help. Right, he went to his family. He said, "Help me out." And and, go and ahead. right, and it looks like he lost his battle with the, you know suicidal thoughts, and he hung himself. Right, and in this case, Malik decides, well, it wasn't suicide; it was actually an accidental death, mm-hmm. and. Again, it's just stuff like that where it's like, and th- this is just three examples of There's probably like does maybe a dozen or 20 of them out there that, that are pretty well known. Right. And so the governor at this time is Bill Clinton mm-hmm. and people are calling for this guy's job saying, look, we got these two boys that now we believe there's good reason to believe that there was some foul play mm-hmm. and this guy is ruling this. We dug up all this other stuff. He's not doing his job. And taxpayers are paying for that. They want him to call, you know, they want Bill Clinton to ask for his resignation. Right. Bill, Bill Clinton says, well, I, I'm not really in charge of doing that. Mm-hmm. That's not really my thing. So what do they do? Do they fire him? Do they replace him? No, they give him a 43% raise. Where this leaves us now is we now have to look at these two deaths as murders. Okay. So we need to conduct a proper murder investigation. Mm-hmm. And why were these things covered up? And why does it seem that government officials and people at the medical examiner's office and the sheriff's department, they seem to not want to investigate this thing properly? Right. And at what lengths are they going to go to or what is anybody going to go to to possibly cover up this murder? There's so much more to get into. And we're just on the first episode of this. Yeah, because if the cause of death can be overturned. That brings up so many more questions. Okay, first of all, if these boys were murdered, why were they murdered? What what happened during those four hours between the time they left Don's house and the time that they're found on those tracks? What occurred during those four hours? Did they see something that they shouldn't have seen? Mm -hmm. Did they come across somebody that they they shouldn't have come across? What happened to those boys in that four hours? Well, we have a really good idea what happened because we have a bunch of eyewitness accounts we're going to have to get into that tomorrow. Yes, and don't forget to check out all of our old episodes. They're available in the iTunes store and on our store page at truecrimegarage.com. Thank you guys so much for sharing the... Mm, thank you guys so much for sharing... It, mm, thank you guys so much for sharing it with a friend's family. I just got a text message a couple minutes ago saying, Hey, I told somebody about your show. Uh, they don't call it True Crime Garage. They call it The Captain Show. The Captain Show. Well, imagine that. <laughs> Isn't that special? All right. We'll see you guys in the garage tomorrow. And until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter. <laughs>